So it's a very warm welcome today to Mr. Ken Honda to the Global Business Podcast. Ken, welcome to the show. Thank you. Hello, Mark and everybody. I'm so excited to be here on your show. I'm doing this from Japan, uh, Tokyo, Japan, and it's very, very hot here. In the heat of summertime, there's uh, it's a very humid city, isn't it? Japan in the in the middle of summer, especially Tokyo, with so many people there. Yes, I just uh, came back uh, from my mountain uh, place uh, last night. So uh, this is like incredibly hot. <laughs> so whereabouts in Japan is your mountain place? Where do, where do you go to hide away? Yeah, it's about a couple of hours uh, a drive from Tokyo, and and uh, in there. I have all the books I've collected all my life, so I'm in heaven. Oh, that's so. a beautiful place to go. I was just thinking this morning, actually, where I'm going to put my little library on my sailboat. I want to have a library on my boat, and I've, I'm trying to f find out where I'm going to put it. Wow, beautiful. <laughs> You're just uh, manifesting many people's dream living on a boat. Well, I think we can, and we're going to we're going to talk about this today because I think manifestation and visualization is a very important part of our life journey that a lot of people um, don't associate with. Is that right? Yes, I so agree. Yeah, I can't wait to start this. <laughs> okay, well, let's get going. <laughs> but the first thing is what I always offer my guests, Ken, is the opportunity to dedicate their show to someone special in their life. So, who would you like to dedicate your episode today in your life? Oh, that's a beautiful thing to do. My wife, Julia, and uh, my daughter, Hannah. Julia and Hannah. Yes. Well, this is a dedication to them from Ken, and that's a, that's a beautiful dedication as well. And you can all sit down perhaps and look at the show together, and uh, they can find out about the dedication. So thank you very much for dedicating the show to them. Now, we're going to talk a lot about money today, and we're living in very changing times around the world. So I think money is a very important subject for us to talk about. But first of all, the whole idea about, you know, you've written a book about uh, money called Happy Money, and we're going to talk about that. But where, where did money and happiness, where did those two subjects come into your life to make it ex exciting for you? You know, uh, let me just share a little bit of my father. My father is a very successful accountant, and he taught me everything about money since I was like four or five. So I had a great mentor to start with. And uh, as I grew up, I learned that there are happy people not ha happy people, they're wealthy people, not wealthy people. And uh, I, I couldn't really understand why certain people, not necessarily the smartest, uh, become rich. Mm. On the other hand, a lot of work, uh, hardworking people don't necessarily end up being wealthy. And uh, also I saw so many people who uh, have the money, but they, they're in, they don't seem happy. They didn't seem to be happy at all. So I just sort of like went out on a quest since I was uh, um, my in my twin, uh, teens, to look for the, the secrets of of money. Mm. And where did this journey begin for you? Like when you when you sit down and you say, right, I want to explore these things that you just talked about in terms of the correlation between money and happiness. Where do you go? Mm. Where do you go looking for that? It was uh, my um, personal journey. My father's um, uh, client committed a family suicide, and because of that, my father became uh, deep, uh, fell down deep into depression. And uh, my family was a fairly happy one. You know, we had uh, uh, enough money. Um, so, uh, but uh, after getting into this uh, very dark place as a family, I really wanted to know the secret of happiness and money. So since then, I've been reading all the books I could uh, uh, put my hands on, and I've interviewed so many happy people, wealthy people, and not so, you know, <laughs> the people who don't have both either, you know. So I just came up with this idea. There is this uh, deep relationship between money and happiness. Mm. And what do people say when you approach them and you say to them, I want to interview you about money and happiness? How do people respond to that question? <laughs> I, I don't, I you know I'm a Japanese person, so I, we don't uh, talk about it that way, right? <laughs> so we just, uh, uh, that's sort of like a very subtle way, uh, so like a, you know, casual conversation, because money and sex are the biggest two taboos still in the modern culture. So uh, instead of just getting to them talk, it's almost like, you know, uh, you're an FBI agent. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. Criminals to confess. 
it's almost impossible uh, to get somebody to talk about their financial life or sexual life. I guess it's like dating a, a lady and asking her out. You've got to you've got to go specifically in there to get the right questions. So, yeah. do you have any specific questions that you can share with us when you're talking to people about trying to open them up to talk about money? So uh, a lot of people feel easier talking about their work. Mm. So you know, uh, um, like I uh, ask uh, what kind of line of work they they do, you know, at the party casually, and then I kind of like uh, ask them what excites you the most in your work and what you're not satisfied with the work, and then gradually like, so do you feel in, uh, compensated enough? You know, yeah. So that's when yeah. people kind of start like, no, 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 I think I'm worth more. <laughs> like, right? I'm, I'm, I'm actually overpaid. You know, so I can tell so much about uh, whatever they talk about money. So when you're having that conversation about their work, do they actually get down to specifics and tell you exactly how much they earn? What's interesting is like, I must have a face that people want to talk about secrets. <laughs> so like they, they feel safe with me. So they talk about, you know, even I, I, I sit, sit, sit down with a, a stranger in an airplane, you know, they talk about their life. So. Uh, people trust me, I guess. So, and I, I hope. So, I don't, you know, talk about other people's secret, um, secrets. So, people confide with me about their the darkest secret, you know, that they had never talked to anybody in life. So, I've known so many uh, dark sides and also the light side of people's financial and their personal lives. I'm sure culture has something to do with it as well, being Japanese, mm -hmm. and um, I'm sure people feel that trust and security with you because you are Japanese. Would you agree with that? Yes, and also um, uh, I have a good reputation for keeping people secrets, and I, people, uh, you know, feel safe because that it, it's almost impossible for them to surprise me with their stories, you know, because <laughs> I've, I've heard all those weird bizarre and strange stories about money well i'll tell you what i'm going to tell you a secret story after the show today and i'm going to see whether you can keep it a secret because you've never heard a story about money like i'm going to tell you today okay so wow. I can't wait it's, it's a gonna, great great it's, bonus it's and, and um I'll, we'll we'll talk about it later but maybe i will share it on the show at some stage but not not yet i mm -hmm. want to talk to you about it though um now you focus on happy money when did happy money as a concept come into your life journey as you were going through this this process of finding out more about money why happy money you know i had this uh, great opportunity to meet my mentor um his name is wahe takeda mm -hmm. and uh he he's called warren buffett of japan because he was the most successful private investor and he was one of the wealthiest uh, japanese men uh, per people uh people here and uh, I had this uh, great opportunity to be with him for like a few minutes alone. So I asked him, what is the secret of money? And he smiled and she, she said, it's very simple. You only arigato your money. That means appreciate your money. <laughs> mm. What? Thank your money? <laughs> I, I thought he would teach me like a secret of stock tips or investment tips. You know, if you could ask uh, Warren Buffett, what would you ask, right? And he yeah. said, appreciate your money. And then I started thinking, you know, uh, if, if this guy is telling me appreciating uh, money coming in and going out is a key to happiness and, and abundance, I'll try that. So that is sort of how I sort of started looking at money mm. as more uh, energy or uh, um, a more psychological thing. It's not just a uh, balance sheet or profit and loss statement. It's more about uh, the feeling because more appreciate about your money. Uh, the funny, funny thing is like I I love money. A lot of people uh, love money, but uh, as as much as they love money, they don't want money to be close to them because they feel scared or they're worried about it. So you have to be you have to fall in love with the money. Mm. You want to be happy mm. and wealthy. So <laughs> those are the things I learned from him. That's amazing. Have you always had a good relationship with money yourself? Uh, as I said, you know, my father went into alcoholic, so I thought it's because of money. We had enough, uh, you know, uh, a lot of money. So uh, because of money, I thought he got sick. Mm. If we if if we didn't have money, he had to work. 
right? But he kind of retired uh, in his early 40s because of money. Uh, so I thought money is uh, uh, so like a, a not not a root of all evil, but at least money plays some part. So mm. people can be lazy, or people can be uh, sick or uh, depressed or angry about. So I was a little afraid of money at the beginning of my life. Mm. Now you've also lived in uh, the United States for a few years. You lived in Boston, is that correct? Yes. It's a fantastic city. Did you like living in Boston? Not the winter, though. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. The winters are very harsh there, but uh, the summer and spring and autumn are pretty nice. Pretty nice times. But what yes. I what I was going to ask you about that is, how did you see the relationship with money living in a different country? Was that fascinating to you? You know, um, the, uh, one of the profession I wanted to pursue when I was in my 20s is an anthropologist. Mm -hmm. So I'm fascinated with the way people react with money. And since my book is out uh, probably in 20 countries now, uh, I get a lot of emails from, you know, different people in, in the world. And, I, and I'm so fascinated because they ask different questions at the same theme. But, uh, for example, in America, people ask me, how can I make more money uh, and, and be happier? Where uh, in Japan, people say, how can I be satisfied with the money I have? Mm. It's a different approach. Mm. Mm. So uh, the, the culture difference fascinates me. So was it, was it any harder for you to live in America because of their outlook on money? I think in terms of money, uh, United States is an easy, uh, simple place because uh, people don't have a complicated uh, uh, concept. Uh, like uh, the, the more money you have, like more success. It's mm. very simple. Mm. Or in Japan and probably a part of Europe and, uh, uh, and other countries, uh, people have more mixed feeling, right? Uh, uh, the wealthy people get respect, but at the same time, they're, they're scorned. Um, so it's a little bit different uh, attitude. Hmm. Do you think people that who are born into money coming from wealthy families, do you think they have a different association with money because of their, you know, just their heritage and where they've come from? Yes, definitely. I, uh, actually, in fact, I went to uh, 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 very uh, well-known Catholic school in Japan. So many of my classmates were very wealthy. Uh, so I know how uh, certain family wealth uh, do your psyche uh, in your system. So if you're born into a wealthy family, uh, money wasn't there. So uh, people have different attitude. And also, uh, if they are more talented than um, themselves, they're okay. Mm. But mm. the tragedy is that uh, the people are born into a wealthy family without any skills and without any uh, um, mentality and if their parents didn't teach you enough about money you'll be out on the street it's so miserable because they know what wealth it, uh, does can do for you and uh, so if they didn't have all the resources you know their life is more miserable mm. than mm. people didn't have money yeah understandably so now you talk a lot about happy money but what's unhappy money does unhappy money exist I, I think it's a 95 percent of us are living in the circulation of unhappy money unhappy money makes you feel ooh when you receive money mm. and then you feel like frustrated when you spend money when for example when you get bills and you have to pay them like ooh, i don't want to pay so, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, taxes and other things you feel like some part of you gets ripped off yeah and also when you, when you receive money you get upset like is this all i get you know after all the hard work you know a month one one month of my life energy ends up in this number so you feel frustrated you're angry you're worried about it so unhappy money uh gives you all the frustration and anger and miserable feeling around money but money is not doing it you are doing it to yourself i, w I want to bring out a uh, a little antidote that i want to share with you today that you've probably never heard before about money in relation to boats and as you know i'm i'm living and working on my sailboat and mm -hmm. i wanted to ask you today do you know what the word boat actually means no boat yeah it stands for b-o-a-t right boat mm -hmm. bring out another thousand that's <laughs> 
because whenever you buy a boat it sucks up a lot of your money so the terminology is now used across the world that if you have a boat you need to bring out another thousand b-o-a-t isn't that good that's, that's interesting and I, I think that the bigger the bigger your boat is the more thousands as well. <laughs> exactly right exactly right now we're living in very uncertain times across the world at the moment so how's that impacting people's relationship with money do you think i think people are more worried about more stressed about uh, money uh, more than ever because uh for that for example in in the united states more than 20 million people are on are living on government paycheck which they're going to lose next month uh, next month uh so a lot of people are worried about their future and and they're worried about if they could get enough job or bring food on the table so i think people are genuinely worried and stressed around money uh right now mm. and as you talk a lot about also is that it has that correlation to our happiness so if there's a view coming up that these people are going to lose these uh benefits that they're getting they're going to be down on their income therefore their uh, their happiness is going to be impacted significantly mm -hmm. as well that's an interesting concept to me because I, I've always tried to live and I continue to try and live a life where my happiness is not affected by the amount of money that I have. And we'll mm -hmm. talk we'll talk more about that as we go forward. But um, how can we invite happy money into our lives? Is there a way, is there a process that you actually talk about in terms of inviting happy money into our life? Thank you, Mark. That's a beautiful question. As I said, as I talked about my mentor, it's there's only one thing. Arigato your money. Appreciate your money. Mm. So when you receive money, just thank your money. Thank you for coming in. And when you spend money, also say thank you. Thank you to the money and the people you're paying to because uh, these people are rendering uh, some service for you in exchange for money. Mm. So there are millions of reasons uh, to appreciate them. And also when you receive check, uh, that means uh, uh, somebody uh, chose you and just ordered uh, food or uh, clothes and service. So they chose you as, uh, as your customer. So they, uh, they decided to give you money. I, I think that's a big reason to appreciate about. Hmm. So the more appreciation you have about money, the more fulfilled you are and more uh, whole. So you start this cycle of appreciation. And I've done uh, many studies and a lot of uh, uh, readers of my books uh, they sent me all the uh, thank you letters because, um, one, uh, for example, one of my students is a single mom uh, secretary. She was complaining about her boss for not paying her well. Mm -hmm. uh, but she realized that she didn't have a college degree, but still she was hired as a secretary. So she started thanking him mm. and, and as, 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 as well as thanking the money. And uh, a few weeks later, she got a big raise and a big bonus because that appreciation from her probably landed on uh, her boss. So mm. if you appreciate it, you want to do something back to the person. So appreciation really opens uh, a new door for your opportunity. So go out there today, everybody, and get to appreciate and show gratitude to people because it'll come back to you in good ways, Ken, won't it? Yes, and the people who pay you and the people you're paying somebody you appreciate both and it's uh, just uh, do it over a week and then check how you feel so differently it's it's really amazing because what you're talking about is something so simple yet it's something that we do every day in our lives which is spending money and receiving money and and yet we probably spend very little time or no time at all actually appreciating that process as you're describing now I find it very fascinating yes and uh, if you look at the world you know, we're almost like a connected, it's like an internet. We are connected in this web of uh, a flow of um, money energy flow. Mm. You know, it, it, you like it or not, we are connected in this uh, web. Yeah. So it's almost like a, a humanity uh, uh, subconscious uh, network. Okay. So yeah. either you are in the flow of very unhappy, very frustrated uh, network or very happy very appreciative network you know you can choose by mm. choosing your emotion around money exactly exactly right now i'm interested to know that you've done a lot of research on happy money and you've talked to a lot of people about money in their lives how has the relationship 
with money changed over the decades though have you actually gone back in history and looked at how the relationship with money has has impacted humanity i think so you know i think uh i started talking about uh, how this COVID thing is impacting humanity back in march mm -hmm. so my uh youtube has has been hit has, has hit six million downloads mm -hmm. views mm -hmm. so uh i just talk about it very briefly but I think that we are at the turning point of uh, of civilization. You know, our our uh, capitalism started in 1602 with a uh, East Dutch company, uh, East in, uh, East Indian companies in 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 Holland, and uh, over the f uh, 400 years, um, all of us have been pursuing profit and money. But it's been changing because you know what? Look what we have done. <laughs> uh, we have ex exploited all the nature resources. We exploited from one another, or just countries. So uh, we are on the verge of. Uh, we are on the tipping point. That, and I think from now, this whole thing is going to uh, shift our humanity. And I'm very excited and very happy about the change. But to get there, we have to go through this very scary place because uh, we are living in scarcity. That's what it does. We've been all brainwashed that there's not enough in the world. But if you just breathe in and just relax, you realize that there's more than enough if we start sharing. If we try to take advantage of other people, if we try to uh, be more, take more, then uh, we don't have enough. But once we start sharing, we would realize that we have in more than enough there is abundance of everything on this planet and that's essentially what you're talking about and I'm absolutely inspired by all the guests that come on this show and say to me that we all feel that there's a reset going on at the moment across the planet and it's both yes. from the environmental point of view and also from mm -hmm. the humanity point of view and and this is our biggest opportunity I think that we've ever had as a species to get it right and to look yes. back and reflect on where we've gone wrong and and what we need to do more positively in the future i'm interested to know does age have an impact on our relationship with money as we get older do we see money through in different ways yes that's also an interesting uh, um, uh, viewpoint i i've published uh, about 50 some books and one of my uh, best-selling series is like 17 things to do in your teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, I sold about 2 million copies. Hmm. And to write this uh, bestseller, I have interviewed more than a few hundred people. And uh, so, you know, uh, to write a book, 17 things to do in your 30s, I interviewed people in their 40s and 50s. So, you know, I've interviewed the, the generations by block and block. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's interesting is that money in your 20s is so totally different thing in money in your 60s it just uh, same same uh, goes with sex sex in your 20s probably like everything but you know, if, you grow, <laughs> if you grow to be in your 60s and 70s sex could mean something else so money uh, can be as addictive but as you grow there is also this uh, almost like a Zen enlightenment you know but that money doesn't come you enough so you have to uh, so sort of like adjust your life Mm. So you don't need them anymore, right? Mm. So uh, it's so interesting. Like uh, generations, they have different issues. So let's talk about that because you have a lovely daughter, and as a parent, I guess it's an important process also to educate your children about money and mm -hmm. the pathways to money. How how do you recommend that parents have conversations with their children about money and getting them to value money? Yes, I actually wrote a few books on how to raise a happy ch uh, children with money. Mm. So in there, I, I wrote that uh, there are two kinds of uh, uh, educating uh, your, your children. Uh, do you want um, your kids to be uh, on their own or uh, financially? Or do you want um, your kids to be secure with money? A lot of people try to educate their kids. so they will not run out of money their life. So mm. that means uh, better education, better job, so you, they stay uh, getting the uh, same uh, paycheck. So uh, instead of going, encouraging them to pursue their dreams, they try to teach them subconsciously to stay secure, not 
take too much too many risks mm. so in, i talk to thousands of people all the time and they say there are uh, 2000 people in the auditorium and i ask them do you want your kids to be financially success and uh, uh, super wealthy or do you want your kids to be financially stable maybe it's a different in japan but 99 percent of uh, the japanese parents they they want their kids to be secure mm. and safe mm. so if you want your kids to be secure financially, you know, uh, educate them, uh, get a better grades, and just stay in the school system, and uh, be corporations. And as you have worked in international business, you know the difference between you know, in a secure job and following your dreams, right? Absolutely, yeah, indeed. It's totally different rules. Yeah, what happens though in a situation where the children don't have the best role models when it comes to financial planning and advice uh, from their parents? Maybe their parents haven't been so um, clever or smart or educated around money. What do you propose then? How do, how do young people find out how to be more um, connected to money in a positive way? Yes, and... Uh, that's how why I wrote a few books on how to find your mentor mm. and in the preface I said unfortunately uh, um, most of our parents are not the best role models but that's good news because <laughs> then we have to start looking for uh, one for us mm. and so we have to start looking for uh, great mentors for me like Wahe Takeda yep. so uh, you have to find uh, the right people to guide you uh, and your parents uh, cannot necessarily do that. And uh, if you find your parents as a mentor, that's super good. But uh, like maybe one percent of the parents can be even eligible for being a good mentor. Mm -hmm. Every, everybody talks uh, on the show about mentors. It's a very important part of, of business and life in general. What what mm -hmm. are your recommendations when it comes to finding the right mentor for you? Do you have a do you have a process? Do you have a practice that you go through to find the right mentors? Yes, uh, this is my favorite subject because I wrote a few books and I done um, maybe like ten more seminars on how to find mentors. There are certain steps, so you have to find out what you want, uh, the qualities you want for in your mentors, and also you have to know who you are too. For example, uh, I'll make it brief, but if you are go with the flow type or just a uh, goal oriented type. So if you are goal oriented type, uh, you're attracted to go with the flow type of people. And if you go with the flow, no plans, you tend to be attracted to goal oriented people mm -hmm. because that's what you don't have. But uh, if you uh, find a mentor who is not a good match for you, uh, uh, your mentors could t tear you apart, you know, because you're not supposed to do what you're supposed to do. So you have to find who you are first, and then find the right mentors. And I'm, I've, I've uh, collected all the horrible stories of what mentor can do you, to your self-esteem and your relationship. They could really mess you up. So yeah. you have to know who you are. Yeah, that's very good advice. I will add, though, I think there's a degree of sensibility in around taking a mentor that pushes you out of your comfort zone somewhat. That's true. And, and that's true. you know, we were just talking about, about this before the show started today, that life really begins outside your comfort zone. That's what I believe. So it may be courageous in some aspects to get a mentor that pushes you out but i think you're talking about drawing the line where it, it almost doesn't become a bully you don't want a mentor who's a bully yes. you want yes. somebody who's respectful and and also pushes you and challenges you in the right areas would you agree with that yes totally you know some mentors are so frustrated emotional so they take it out on you Mm. <laughs> because you're just you do anything for him or her yeah so uh, don't become a sandbag you know but <laughs> bag of, uh, for them to punch instead you have to find a f uh, affectionate uh, lovable uh, full of love mentors Wahe Takeda was like that he never said no uh, not negative thing to anybody and uh, uh, if you f uh, uh, if you just have uh, like three seconds with that kind of person your life will be transformed. Mm. So you'll be super lucky if you can find somebody like that. Mm. And uh, I, I've been having such uh, blessed 
life because I had so many great mentors like that. So I guess in terms of some people are a little bit nervous when it comes to selecting a mentor. I've always believed to reach for the stars when it goes huh? to for mentors. Get the highest person that you can possibly get um, who's yes. had the most experience in the field that you want to go into and, um, huh? and aim for that person because what can they say? They can just say no, can't they? And that's the worst thing that can happen. Right. So in my book, uh, I, there's a chapter, Upgrading Your Mentor. Mm. You know, certain time you have to upgrade your mentor mm. because as you grow. Yeah. So I I have upgraded my mentor so many times uh, as I grew. So that's a, a difficult process for some mentors. You know, if they are happy mentors, they congratulate you on growing, and if they're not happy. They try to pull you down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I yeah, understand that. I would, all, I, I would also say to people that using your intuition and your gut feeling is very important when it comes yes. to, to mentors and, and most things in life. You know, we should trust our instincts a lot of the time because they're usually right. And yes. the same thing can apply when, when going to mentors. Is that something you do? Is that Do you go on your gut feeling a lot as well? Yes, and I... I was uh, very impressed with your uh, TED presentation, and I believe in destiny as well. So I think if there's a past life, uh, I think uh, some mentors and I have uh, must have a very deep uh, connection uh, in my previous lives, if there are any. Mm. So uh, because I felt so like a deja vu in so many situations, like ah, oh, I feel like this is not the first time. So the more uh, a feeling I had uh, with them, like a, a, a deeper uh, affection and also deeper appreciation that uh, in this life we meet again. And then we, we st start this uh, uh, fun uh, journey again. So I always feel uh, go with the flow, uh, trust your uh, intuition, and then um, see what happens. You gave me a beautiful segue into spirituality then, so I'll use it. And uh, let's talk about spirituality when it comes to money. Does that exist? Do you believe that there is a spiritual connection to money? Of course, of course. You know, I teach in my fin uh, financial independence seminar, money IQ, uh, emotion, uh, 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 financial intelligence, and also money EQ. Uh, I teach money EQ course uh, I've, I've taught about the course for the past 20 years, mm. and that is my, the uh, most popular course I, I teach. So, uh, and also uh, in this money EQ, emotional intelligence, there is a spiritual side to that. You know, you can be Catholic, Muslim, uh, whatever your religion, uh, money can be very spiritual because whatever you project out, um, um, money becomes that. So if you believe money is God, uh, money can be your God. And, and then uh, if you want money to be spiritual, money can be very spiritual for you. Mm. So money can um, be like a chameleon. It can be in any forms. I'm a big believer in meditation and visualization. I practice those things on a daily basis. Are, are you a believer as well that those two concepts can actually help you attract uh, money into your life in a, in a happy way? Yes, indeed. Um, my meditation is more like a Zen meditation. Uh, there, uh, because uh, every everything I do uh, is very sacred. So this um, uh, conversation is a very deep meditation for me too. Mm. So uh, I I think there's a, a beautiful relationship between uh, who you are and what you do and what you think will also be reflected on your financial life. Yeah, agree totally with that. Let's talk about um, a relationship with money in a different sense because we're going through, as we've mentioned a couple of times now, difficult times. It can put pressure on households. It can put pressure on relationships. So a lot of couples might be in a situation at the moment where they're fighting over money. What's, what advice do you give to them? Uh, that's one of my fun uh, time in my career, uh, couple counseling on money. And uh, I do that uh, a lot in front of uh, thousands of people too, uh, public ones. And people love it because uh, what's, uh, fight what they're fighting over for them is so super important. But for us, it's just, uh, it's just funny. Right. <laughs> because you know, certain thing is super important for husbands. 
uh, is also like, what? Why is so important? Um, you don't get it from the other side. I don't want to generalize by men and women, but we tend to think in a totally different different way. I, I call it more positive than negative, but certain people uh, want to try to take a look at money from a positive side. And for, for example, if your husband, uh, it doesn't really matter if it's a male or female, but uh, if one person is trying to be positive, the other person tends to be negative. Hmm. So uh, there's this dichotomy, there's this stress, like uh, people, <clears throat> one person say, Oh, it's like only $5? It's so cheap. <laughs> and, and she said, no, 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 we can't afford $5 anymore. <laughs> yeah. Only $5, right? And it's crossed $20. So, like, it's a great bargain. And she said, no, 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 we don't have, we don't need any, any more glasses. So, right. the fight is like that, you know. So, I'm oversimplifying it. But uh, when it boils down to, it's a very uh, <clears throat> funny thing. So, if you can... Uh, think from the other side you know you can meet in the middle but but we are so stubborn in so many ways that we want to be right so I was asking uh, my clients do you want to be happy or do you want to be right if yeah you want to be right you lose happiness yeah and potentially marriage <laughs> so and uh, and then the, the next question is if he does that I'll do that no 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 it doesn't work that way <laughs> you have to choose one before he or she chooses yeah so let's talk about that i'll put you on the spot and ask you from the research that you've done and and all the books you've written and all the engagements you've had with people about money are women better than handling money than men or are men better than women handling money i think it's nothing to do with sex it's more of uh yeah what what you think and what you feel mm. because uh, men and women can make stupid mistakes and even if, if they come from the best university, even they, uh, they have doctor degrees uh, or uh, they are uh, MBAs or male, female, doesn't really matter. They could make a most emotionally stupid mistakes. So mm. uh, it's more of how you, <clears throat> how you relate to money is more important than what you think of money. Mm. Because you know, in, in Europe, uh, it's like diet, you know. Uh, eating potato chips and french fries are not good <laughs> even if you're spending is not good but if you look at the dress if you look at the car fancy gadgets or boats like oh i worked so so many hours i sh i deserve this or mm. i deserve a nice handbag or a scarf or jewelry or whatever that is mm. you know it's it's not decided up here it's a more emotional one so uh, you have to really pay attention to your emotions. Have you done any research or studies on people who give money away, such as philanthropists and people yes. who donate to charity? What What's the feelings around those things? Yeah, well, uh, my mentor Wahe was big on uh, philanthropies, uh, and he was uh, he was focusing and also he was edu educating uh, what he called uh, danna. That means uh, local. Uh, philanthropy. Mm -hmm. No, not, you don't. You don't have to be Bill Gates or Warren Buffett to be a philanthropist. You know, very tiny local philanthropy. Just uh, uh, you know, just a little money. Uh, donate a little money here and there uh, is super important. And I think I'm I'm t I'm teaching us as, as well. I think it's more important for all of us to start sharing. If you feel like if you have more than enough, uh, just share your uh, money with other people. I'm, I'm actually uh, asking all the wealthy individuals in uh, in my circle to start sharing what you have, and and even if you have uh, uh, 100 extra dollars, you know, just try to uh, donate that. And and if you feel like you don't have money, just uh, donate a one dollar in a little uh, box at the cash register at the supermarket. That gives you such a good feeling. So uh, sharing what you have. Is very important, and and, I, and that's a number four uh, principles in money EQ. Share your money. Mm, that's beautiful, and I just wanted to share something with you about that because yesterday I had a CEO on my show, and she was talking about how she's actually paying for her customers' payroll at the moment to keep their businesses afloat. 
because she she wants her her customers to be there on the other side of COVID-19 and Mm -hmm. she's helping out in that way and I thought that was a very generous and a very noble thing to do in terms of these difficult times of everybody sticking together. Mm -hmm. You talk about sharing money and I'm a very big proponent of the sharing economy that's starting to occur very quickly around the world. Um, Mm -hmm. What is what is the future for money? Because is there going to be a time where we don't see money anymore in the way that we see it today? Do you think, Ken? Yes. Uh, in my, uh, I think the last chapter, the future of money, uh, I, I talked about uh, the so like uh, money in 2025. Uh, you know, uh, uh, centuries ago, salt and pepper were super precious, so people uh, try to kill each other for. But uh, we don't kill each other because of salt, right? If your neighbor is trying to get your salt, uh, you don't stop them or shoot them. So it's the same way with money. So probably in 10 years time, people have uh, less stress about money. So it's just the numbers. You know, to show you the, the proof, I ask people, uh, say 2,000 people in the audience, and I, I ask them, uh, do how many of you know how much you're paying for utility bills like gas and water? Probably like 20 30 percent people just uh, you know raise their hands and I ask them do you know how much electricity or how many uh, um, meters and, and how many liters of water uh, do you spend a month? Mm. So they know in terms of money, but they don't know uh, how many kilowatts or how many, liters or gallons and because they're not interested yeah yeah and they're so so super shocked there's nobody in the auditorium 2,000 people who knows exactly how many liters or gallons they spent in the previous month and I think probably in five or ten years if there's enough money circulating uh, people will lose interest in um, all the track numbers yeah right uh, uh, I think money will become, potentially become like that. Yeah. People will lose interest. When I ask you this next question, you can take a drink there if you like, and um, you can soothe your throat a little bit while I ask you this. Has the invention of credit cards changed our relationship with money over the years? Yes and no, because um, credit card uh, can um put you in a place where you kind of forget money in a bad way because people lose touch with the fact that they're spending money and they have to make both ends meet. Mm. So there is this, uh, uh, a certain number of people who don't have the Im- imagination that uh, some people are better at making both ends meet. Other people, uh, they don't have the skills to calculate how much they're spending and how much they're making. Mm, mm. So uh, if you don't know um, how to make both ends meet, uh, credit cards are not for you. Something that's become very popular over recent years has been the concept of crowdfunding. So a lot of artists around the world get out there and they ask people from the global community to fund their particular passion that they have. It may be a musician, it might be an artist, it could even be a vlogger on YouTube. Um, Mm -hmm. The concept of things like Patreon and all these sorts of things have become quite widespread. Is crowdfunding happy money or do you see that differently? If uh, crowdfunding is strictly for a good cause or no strings attached, I think it's happy money. But if the crowdfunding, uh, often you have to promise, you know, if you pay $50, I'll give you this. I think it's sort of like a uh, money in exchange. So like if you get uh, uh, $50 worth of something, you're just getting paid in advance. So I think there are two kinds of crowdfunding. One is for a very spiritual supporting and loving, and the other is sort of like a a pre-order campaign. Mm. Mm. And so, therefore, over an extended period of time, if it has a negative connotation to it, it's going to bring negative connotations into your life. Is that how you see it? Yes. So uh, I often donate to those charities too. Like, for example, we built 
uh, uh, library in a rural area that kids can go to, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. we don't have anything right in return, like right? just a happy smile picture. Yeah. So, uh, so that's that kind of crowdfunding is more happy money than like uh, if you pay fifty dollars, you get a brand new headset, you know, <laughs> uh, pre-order. So it's it's a, like a, a, co- a commercial. It's like a marketing campaign. Mm. So there is uh, two different uh, things uh, kind of mixed on the same platform. Right. Okay. Have you ever had a period of your life where you didn't have any money? Actually, it's kind of embarrassing, but uh, I've been blessed with money. So I've never borrowed any money. I bought uh, properties and cars, everything in cash. So I'm in a probably like a very different uh, place uh, um, than many people. Mm. Have you ever met anybody who voluntarily decided to change their life where they didn't have money? Can you say it again? Have you ever have met more any English, English question? <laughs> have you ever met anybody who voluntarily yes. changed their life to have no money? Yes, you uh, have. I call them uh, monks. Not okay. necessarily, uh, literally monks, mm. but there are those who donated everything and they decided to uh, be a minimalist. I, some of my friends are that way in a uh, uh, countryside where they own, grow their own food and stuff. I think it's a fun way of living too. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was also going to suggest as a result of asking you that question mm-hmm. is that the man sitting in front of you today has also done that with his life. That's beautiful. And I, I experimented with that process and I'll tell you more about that off offline. Living in abundance, what does that mean when it comes to money? So abundance versus scarcity is I, I often talk about. Abundance is... Um, like uh, one time I was in Hawaii, and uh, uh, there are so many uh, uh, mangoes and, and grapefruits and all that. So uh, every morning I, I was uh, renting uh, this place for a week. Uh, for the first day uh, or two, my family, my daughter was very small at the time. Like we went crazy, you know, <laughs> like $10 worth of uh, organic grapefruits and mangoes are everywhere so I like I, I, I ate three or four or five you know like we were so super excited and the second day and third day we didn't even pay attention anymore because you know it's there so uh, and then there are so many and they're just kind of like they stay there f- uh, uh, for uh, ready to be rot mm. so I try to you know uh, give away to my uh, neighbors mm. but m- my neighbors also had many trees <laughs> right. <laughs> right yeah I think that's uh, abundance. Mm. You know, there's more than enough. Mm. Yeah, uh, like uh, right now, uh, in my uh, mountain place, uh, I got so many fruits and veggies every every day yeah. from my neighbors, uh, from my fans, that my family cannot consume. So, uh, like a few days ago, I got uh, twelve melons. You know, I like melons, mm. so people know. <laughs> so, I got. 12 melons in one day what can you do wow Wow. so i try to give one very nice melon to my neighbors i try to fedex them and then (laughs) in two days i got watermelons mangoes (laughs) and then i have to ship them over my fedex guy guy was uh, laughing you know (laughs) sir you get i think you get some fruits again (laughs) (laughs) this is what i call abundance you know you have more than enough to eat Mm. so Whereas scarcity is like, I, I, I cannot uh, um, sp- spend this $5 because if I spend this $5, I'll be on the street. So mm. this is like scary, frustrated, uh, 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 contracting feeling. Mm-hmm. That's scarcity. It's mm. scary. Mm. So either if you live in uh, abundance or scarcity, it's your choice. And a lot of people ask me, can you live in an abundant world because you have enough money? That's not. You have to live in abundance in my in your heart first and in your head in your heart first. Yes. Otherwise, it takes a little time hmm. uh, to to get it out in the real reality. But you have to change what's inside of your head and in your heart first. Is there any research around and data around that what you've studied over the years to suggest that there is a particular age within our life where that abundance of money 
is at its highest point is is there an age range that you can actually talk about so i think uh in terms of uh a financial iq uh you're late uh if you are not laid off um your late 50s will be the usually for a lot of people uh prime time prime earning time but those are the time when you're if you have kids you uh a lot of money uh, uh will be out uh, from your pocket too so i think uh, you have to plan your life well, otherwise you always feel constant uh, <laughs> need to uh, this uh, stress of money. Mm. Uh, in your 20s, you're always broke. In your 30s, you're always broke. In your 40s, <laughs> your, your kids ask you for more money. Uh, <laughs> my friend said, I have three robberies in my house. <laughs> because... <laughs> they, they ask us, you know, more money every time they see us. So yeah, you know, yeah. you know what I'm talking talking about, I guess. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that that's a very good way of putting it. Do you think there's enough happy money in the world today, Ken? Not enough yet. That's why I'm just doing this, and I'm, that's why I'm encouraging everybody, uh, listener, to start appreciating your money. My vision is to uh, impact uh, one. Uh, being people who just uh, start living in this circulation of uh, happy money. Mm. And I think because of my books, I sold 8 million copies in Japan. Mm -hmm. I sold about a few hundred thousand in English for, uh, finally. Yep. I've impacted millions of people's lives here. Um, people <clears throat> have, been, have sent me uh, at least 100,000 emails and, and physical letters to me saying their life is different after just learning about this um, happy, happy money idea. Yep. And it doesn't cost you anything, you know, it's just a, a mental shift uh, from frustration to appreciation. Yeah. And once yeah. you start doing that, your life will be completely different and it doesn't cost you anything and it doesn't take so much discipline, just, you know, uh, just curiosity. Mm. If my, I have more happy money in my life, and if all the people start doing, it's contagious. So I hope uh, in, in five years, will, people will start sharing what we have. And we need to do that because of a uh, contracting economy. We need to support one another uh, mm. in the next five years. Mm. Well, thanks to your generosity today, we're going to help 10 listeners to the show because we're going to give away 10 copies of your amazing book called Happy Money. And um, do you want to tell the listeners how we're going to do that, Ken? What do they have to do to get a copy of your book sent to them? So I, I want um, you to write or share uh, your happy money story, how happy money changed in your life. I guess probably you never heard of happy money until I mention it. But then uh, once you hear about happy money, oh, I know about that, what Ken is talking about. My father gave me this or my sister or my neighbor, my uncle, uh, whoever that is. Uh, for me, I had a stranger give me, uh, give me money and save my life. So uh, I'm, I, I'm sure you had that, some kind of experiences. So I want you to share what you know. I'm, I'm happy. I'm, I, I love so much when people start talking about their experiences, experiences with happy money. OK, fantastic. So what we're going to do is you're going to send us your happy money story and you're going to put it in the comment section on the Humanity Facebook page. I'm going to put all the links in the show notes today of the show and we're going to give away 10 copies of Ken's amazing book, Happy Money, so that you can start to learn about a new relationship with money in your life. Thanks to Ken Honda. Ken, it's been amazing having you on the show today. We've got so much that we can continue talking about. So I'm going to have to get you back again for another episode sometime to talk about happy Thank money you. and also happiness because that's uh, the man you are. You're a very happy man. And I appreciate and are very grateful that you've given me your time today to be on the Global Business Podcast. So thank you very much for joining me. Thank you, Mark. I, I so enjoyed this time together and uh, 
one day out and want to visit your boat or you visit us <laughs> either way I, w- I would love to and while we're we're doing the show out in japan today i would like to send a very uh warm sincere wishes to my friends morawaki son and joe son who are over there in japan today and probably also sweltering in the summer heat that ken's enjoying as well in <laughs> tokyo today so ken we will catch up again i'm sure and thank you again for being on the show today thank you mark and thank you everybody bye bye